Welcome to Feminist Question Time, uh, brought to you by Women's Human Rights Campaign, um, uh, which is the leading global organization defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. We've got a website, womensdeclaration.com, where you'll find our declaration on women's sex-based rights, which has been signed by 18,195 people from 137 countries and is supported by 344 organizations. As well as signatories, we have activists. Uh, we have country contacts in 38 countries who are engaged in defending women's rights in their country and in lobbying their UN United Nations representatives and other international institution representatives. If you'd like to get involved in women's human rights campaign activism, then fill in the form that we'll put in the chat, which is a volunteer form, and then our volunteer coordinator can get back to you or get in touch with your country contact. If there isn't a country contact, uh, uh, you can apply to be one and that would be great because the more of us acting on this issue, the better. This week, I'm really pleased to welcome Himena Bautista from Bolivia, who's the Women's Human Rights Campaign country contact. Elena Mish Mishaveska, Mish Mishveska from North Macedonia, who's a declaration signatory. Letitia Van Haren from France. Um, she's a cultural anthropologist and international development and human rights advisor. And at Still Tish, who's a gender abolitionist and socialist who blogs as gender critical woman. Our first speaker is Himena, who's about Himena Bautista. She's from Bolivia and she's going to update us about the organizing she's been doing in Bolivia and in the uh, South American region in the last few weeks. So welcome, Himena, and over to you. Um, okay. What has happened since our first presentation? We have created our social networks and we are sharing the declaration in Bolivian groups. We have a complex and difficult task because queer indoctrination is growing quickly in Bolivia, mainly among young people. What is, what is our group? <laughs> We've created a strong working group of women with degrees in social communication, economics, criminology, and psychology. This has allowed us to build a group of training Bolivian women with a broad understanding of the issues that affect us a class. This is us <laughs> here in Bolivia. Our goals, we are working for a society that respects women and children's human rights based on sex. In the short and medium term, we want to share the declaration so that women human rights are understood, recognized and totally exercised by each and every woman, Bolivian woman. We understand that if one of us does not have the right to be a free woman, none of us will be able to exercise that freedom in a society where machismo and patriarchy are in the first and embedded in Bolivia culture. The long term, we want to try to change the laws that affect us directly, like the gender, gender identity law, where self-identifying men besides invade our space, take away the rights that we have conquered to be considered women subjects of law, which also end up only erasing the concept of being a woman, but also violates the physical and psychological integrity of children and adolescents. The sex-based women's human rights campaign Bolivia supports any biological women without exception. We focus on providing information, defending and promoting our rights by creating support networks to ensure that they are respected. In recent months, we have been supported the creation and organization of a Bolivian LGB front. We understand that alliances are necessary to confront the advance of gender ideology and trans activism. 
social networks. We have started the campaign on Bolivia on this May, posting the articles of our declaration. We managed to reach more than 500 people on Facebook and Instagram. This is a lot for us uh, in a few and a few months. This is our numbers on Facebook, our first publications on Instagram, and our articles. Uh, the worst part, the Bolivian laws. The gender identity law. Uh, now let's think about transsexual who changed his data on the public records and access a job position in which the employer requires women. By hiring a person who will exhibit a female sex data, when in reality he is still being a male person, the employer ends up defrauding and occupying space who work in conditions require female person, as well as defrauding customers. This example acquires great relevance in just areas where the treatment sensitive people such as men, nurseries, schools, etc., is required. Similar situations will occur in the use of public restrooms when transsexual men with a se uh, male sexual condition enters the women's restroom. Uh, any exams for problems for women? Murder in San Sebastian women's prison. A transsexual killed his partner a few months ago. Due to the pressure on the, from the trans activist groups, he was sent to the women's prison in Cochabamba. So they sent a male subject who stayed his partner to death to await trial in, in a place filled with women who are privileged for of liberty of minor crimes. It's awful. Enviada means that his pronouns were respected by the journalists, but the rights of women in prison are not respected by no one. Who cares about women? This is the news. The treat of inv uh, invasion of women restrooms. On our first uh, Facebook page, which is deactivated for the moment by several attacks that we suffered by trans activists for writing the truth, a self-identifying man claims that we will see him in the women's restroom. They know it's a touchy subject for women who are gender critical. This is the man in my first presentation that was invited to talk about women's health by UN Women Bolivia the last year. And he is back with me. Uh, he wrote, thanks, but I'm fine. I love my body that I'm living it. And we'll see it at the women's restroom. He wrote this. I'm sorry. Uh, we understand that just people are indeed at risk when using many restrooms, women's rights and safe space, but respect by social activists. This is a problem that men should deal with themselves. It's not a women issue. From self-identifying men masturbating in bed in bathrooms to rapists. These people prove that cannot be trusted by our safety in such intimate space as bathroom. Um, this is a trigger warning. Please uh, be careful. This is happening. Oh. Uh, Violence against women. We, I'm sorry. We understand that people are a problem in this law. It should say mild violence instead gender violence. We understand that violence has a sole root 
and that is shared by a male person. Men should not take advantage of this terminology to take revenge on women, accusing them of violence against the male gender. Transmasculine women are unprotected when suffering because they are being legally recognized as men, the, the male family no longer applies to them and their mother will remain a simple homicide. In case of suffering another type of misogynist violence, such as viol violence to be a woman or violence for being a lesbian, they could no longer protect it under this law or, or the law against discrimination based on sex orientation. We don't know how the macho crimes committed against the, them typify if they simply identify themselves as men without having legally recognized as such. All trans women murdered in Bolivia have died at the hands of prostitutes who were enraged when they realized that these individuals were not women in prostitution but men self perceive as women in dressed in stereotypical prostitute costumes. Uh, the next, Maria Galindo, uh, she's an anarchist and feminist from Bolivia who, who make a book with several feminine identities uh, in Aymara culture. People are inventing ancestral historicity to legitimate trans people, but the source and deductions have no historical support. And if there have been any trans phenomenon in the past, it would be not a legitimization, but a discovery of serious problem at that time. This is Maria Galindo who presents herself as feminist and anarchist and affirms that women are not a biological reality. In her words, if a woman had, has an uterus or not, that does not make her a woman, but being a woman is a historical and political concept. Yes. We think that the best way to make children and teenagers and their parents understand about the danger of the advance of infamous theory is creating space for feminist education. Without education, women will not know what are the roots of our oppression and it is based on sex. We need to popularize feminist education and create awareness about gender stereotypes and sex-based oppression. Despite the fallacious and denied discourse about biology of the women body should be our duty of every single woman. We need to continue correctly identify who is a woman and who is a man. Teach the teenagers that are experiments with children and teenagers and put them in risk in surgery that mutilate healthy family organs will never make neither then neither as, as a man. Uh, first concern in this disgrace of queer ideology is my cousin. Uh, she's a lesbian girl that transitioned. Also, she's a family doctor who is attending a lot of women who think that is something very wrong with their body and sexuality. She amputated her breasts, she's injected herself testosterone, she's living surrounded by self-identified men. I'm sorry. It is like I never met her or knew before her transition. She's another person that I will never know who she is she now. At first, when she told me that she transitioned, I told that she was okay, it's fine. I, I, 
I didn't know what, what, what was happening. And I didn't know about queer ideology. So I didn't give any importance to that. With time, I started to read some articles with some best friends of mine, Ingrid. He started to tell me about the issues and the problems with queer ideology. And I'm here now, <laughs> talk uh, with my broken English to you and fighting a guy against this deny way of life. She is still being a lesbian. She is still being my cousin. And she is still being a woman. No matter what she did with her body, nothing will change the reality. She will be forever a woman. I'm sorry. Every single part of her breast is cursed tells me that her suffering is still there. Trans activism is an awful movement that will destroy and erase humans, human history. And if we don't react and fight for our children and our sisters, we we if we don't know what to do. And to finish, please don't be silent, don't be a complice. Let's fight, let's talk. Okay, well, we're going to now go to Eleanor from North Macedonia. She's a signatory of the declaration and she's going to tell us about what's happening in, in North Macedonia and the region and in, you know, uh, in general. So, Elena, can you tell us something about the situation with gender, identity, ideology in North Macedonia and about the draft law on self-ID, etc.? Gender identity has not been legally, legally recognized in North Macedonia and there hasn't been a defined procedure for uh, replacing the sex marker in personal documents with the person's preferred gender identity. And this has kind of led to bureaucratic loopholes and procedures that would uh, greatly differ from one person to the other and uh, would heavily depend on the will of uh, the person or institution working on the request for changing the sex marker in personal documents. And uh, one such case was a transgender individual who goes by, by the pseudonym of X, and uh, she had tried to change the sex marker in personal documents for whole nine years with all requests and even administrative court orders being rejected or ignored by the institution that's responsible for, uh, for handling those cases, the administration for civil registration. And finally, with the direct help of some NGOs, a ca uh, case was raised against the then former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia at the European Court of Human Rights. Of course, North Macedonia lost that case and was obliged to define a legal framework for gender recognition. And this was uh, seen both as a stepping stone by NGOs lobbying for transgender issues and as a chance to lobby for a law that would be as progressive as uh, possible. And it's a promise that made and it's a promise they're trying to deliver on. Uh, well, nor, the, the law for uh, on birth registry was unlocked for amendment immediately after the ruling of the um, uh, European Court for Human Rights. That was in early uh, 2019. But since North Macedonia is generally a conservative country, not much, not much was made on that question. And the government has made sure to take things slowly, both in an attempt to not spark public outrage and to make sure that they keep their place in the government. And uh, in a very discreet and quiet manner, finally, at the end of April this year, uh, they, uh, a new uh, draft law amendment was approved by the government. Um, this draft law allows a person's uh, sex in personal documents to be replaced with their desired gender identity solely based on uh, self-identification -identifi and not only in the sex marker, but also by replacing the personal identification number of a person, which uh, contains a three-digit sex marker and a checksum, so basically out of the 13 
numbers, they're going to replace four. And uh, that law also uh, prohibits that any information of the modification of the personal identification number is visible anywhere, which would basically mean that an individual who uh, decide to change their sex with uh, the gender identity will receive a whole new identity. Uh, this replacement is uh, made available to all individuals above the age of 18 who are not currently married. And uh, this, uh, at least by me, is seen as an attempt to preserve the heterosexual marriage as um, also in a risk assessment that was completed about a month ago. Uh, the only identified risk of uh, the law amendment was, uh, uh, and the only identified risk and a concern were people who are currently divorced and have decided to replace their sex with the desired gender identity. Uh, so this law not only greatly undermines women's and children's rights by allowing, uh, allowing men easy and uncontrolled access to women's spaces and a vulnerable woman, but this is also uh, highly homophobic as uh, it, uh, it will likely cause homosexual couples to transition so that they could have a partnership that's recognized by the law, considering that homosexual partnerships are not re legally recognized in North Macedonia. Uh, so this law amendment is currently and its first assembly reading. It uh, has received an EU flag, which is given to laws that are considered of high importance and high priority for, uh, uh, for the country's assessment talks to the European Union. And um, it is likely that it will be passed soon. I mentioned that uh, this law has been approved in a very discreet and quiet manner. And I want to comment a bit on that. So uh, uh, the, uh, the transgender the talks and the transgender lobbying as everywhere is mainly carried by a foreign founded network of NGOs. And even they have been very quiet when talking about this law. Uh, the, the draft law was not celebrated. It was not published anywhere. It was not commented on, and even there was an organization who published uh, a celebratory comment on social networks and deleted it shortly afterwards. So um, there is an also a national registry on, on regu regulations, which allows the public to comment on coming, uh, forthcoming regulations. And uh, there are no comments published regarding this law, although it is allowed to comment on it. None of the comments are being published, so it always says there are no comments on this law. And um, the law also has no, almost no med media coverage, not even positive, not even negative, even right-wing me media is not covering it. So I somehow have a feeling that this trend will continue, at least until this law is passed, which in, is honestly extremely worrying, and it's a great threat to women's rights in the country. Thanks, Elena. And uh, what made you personally realize transgenderism was a threat to women's rights? Well, I am pretty young. I am an IT child and uh, maybe it's kind of hard to imagine me on this side of the discussion, since we are a generation that has grown with social media and have been bombarded with the presence of uh, uh, transgender support on social media and the mantra that trans women are women. Uh, and, uh, but um, a general interest in feminism, which although was pretty liberal at first and rather, uh, rather late has pushed me in the middle of the transgender discourse, where once you're in, it's not really hard to uh, step out of the group thing and see how uh, uh, cognitive dissonant the transgender movement is, itself is. And that's why it's kind of hard to be grasped by the general public because uh, my mother is not going to think that trans women are women ever uh, because she has to be taught that. It's not something that comes naturally. It's something that has to be taught and repeated and uh, so that uh, such an idea can be acknowledged as the, new, and as the ultimate truth. I have also always read a lot of books and have resorted to reading a ton of books on every side of the discussion so that I can make up my own mind about things and... Um, and also listen to a ton of 
podcasts and allowed myself to gather as much info on the subject to make up my mind independently. And I think that one of the first things that really left with me the neary feeling was uh, all the stories about uh, trans uh, identified males uh, and uh, and rapists in women prison and uh, the funding of the trans lobby, which I think I read in a day and I just couldn't sleep for a whole three days. Also, uh, as a woman, I'm well aware of all the optical obstacles I faced to uh, to get where I am and uh, for all the obstacles I have to face for just being a woman. And I don't think it's anyone's right to, to, in a way, water down the experience of myself and billions of other women around the world by adding men to a category of women that uh, have not and will not share our experiences and our struggles. So can you tell us about, in general, women's lives in North Macedonia and where does your government stand on women's rights? Well, North Macedonia is characterized by a pretty dark period of political history under a populist right-wing government, which in its 10 years heavily impacted uh, women's rights. And during that uh, period, altruistic surrogacy was legal, uh, legalized, uh, uh, but also an, an anti-abortion law was passed, which uh, probably was the most restrictive one in the, all of the former Yugoslav countries. Uh, this law was so wrongly formulated that it had left women with dead fetuses waiting for several days to get an approval for an abortion because they were too far off in their pregnancies. Uh, uh, things have moved on in a different direction with the change of the government in 2016 to a center-left one. The abortion law has been amended. A law on prevention and protection from violence against women and domestic violence has been uh, incited as well. But uh, they really haven't shown a great effectiveness and have allowed the SEM to slack off with the excuse that at least we are not like the previous ones. And uh, uh, they have made some pretty bad procedural mistakes. For example, an oversight was made when enacting the amendment uh, uh, on uh, protection, uh, on law and prevention and protection against this uh, discrimination when adding the sexual orientation and gender identity. So the whole uh, law ended up being repelled by the Constitutional Court, which basically left everyone, including women, workers, minorities, with, uh, without an anti-discrimination law until the new amendment was drafted and the whole procedure was gone through again. The government also has a very strong connection with network of foreign funded NGOs, which has actually helped the current political party get to the hot seat. And um, their relationship has been an ongoing one, which uh, results in mutual support and uh, the self ID mentioned earlier, as well as efforts to decriminalize prostitutions, which are already being worked on by the network of NGOs and have increased in volumes in the past month. What this government really has failed to do and what still is a huge problem to all women in Macedonia is the access to healthcare, especially with the concern of women's health. A lack of uh, gynecologists is evident and uh, about 10,000 women in only one municipality in the center, uh, in the capital, uh, uh, about uh, uh, 15,000 Roma women haven't had a, a single gynecologist for over a decade now. And uh, they are one of the most marginalized women in the country. Uh, and uh, they're not the only ones with uh, that issue. The COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic has uh, really uh, shown the government failure to provide healthcare for its citizens. Uh, they have basically outsourced the basic health care to private clinics, which uh, uh, significantly deepened class differences and uh, women are disproportionately affected by it. Another huge issue is domestic violence, where research shows that only about 15% of all incidents are being reported, which is part, uh, partly caused by the hesitance of police to react 
the domestic violence hall as they consider it a private matter between the husband and his wife. Could you briefly tell tell us about if there are any groups, women's groups or LGB groups, supporting uh, women's sex-based rights or opposing gender identity politics? Well, um, basically, uh, feminist activism in the country has been made into a full-time profession and it, in a way, has been monopolized by the network of NGOs uh, uh, I mentioned previously, the foreign funded. And it's basically the same people who are working on different issues. So, for example, if one is uh, uh, one is a director of uh, the organization that's uh, fighting for transgender rights and a program coordinator for the one that's fighting for decriminalizing the prostitution and has a, to, uh, it's a member of a third organization and they are all members of the four together. And uh, they've, in a way, monopolized activism. And uh, any chance of independent activism has, in a way, either been suffocated or there hasn't been a climate or interest for it. And there are currently no organization in the country that would uh, step out against transgenderism or the decriminaliz- uh, decriminalization of prostitution, at least none that I know of. There are some pretty amazing uh, organizations that uh, do work with um, certain women's communities. I can mention one Ken here, who is a grassroots organization supporting single parents with an access on single mothers. And their work is truly amazing. They have a significant network who support each other directly and uh, they help women in gaining economic independence, both through training and with direct assistance. And uh, this is really helpful for women trying to leave their abusive partners. They also uh, have a social business that employs, employs women from this community. They hold feminist activism trainings and uh, their director is, uh, a woman, uh, is such an amazing woman and a great artist and her creativity really shines through everything that they do. And there are also a number of similar organizations that mainly concentrate on specific communities, either workers' community or... My- We're now going to hear from Letitia Van Haren. She's from France. She spoke on the panel for Women and Girls Human Rights, United Nations Language and Terminology at the recent UN NGO CSW Virtual Forum. She's a cultural anthropologist and international development and human rights advisor also president of SAFA, Smart Access to Health for All. So welcome, um, Letitia. Can you tell us about why you signed the Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights? I just will tell you that our first application is especially for women. It is called Jumbo Mama, connecting uh, pregnant women with healthcare providers. So just to know where what my main activity is in the field of helping women on the ground to get their rights and to have a better life. So the reason I signed up is because it's just a way of getting back to the basics. And for me, it seems that we are running ahead and abandon good causes simply because we tire of them or we are in for something new or the social media and everything feels that we have to go on. And this is while the cause at hand has not been tackled at all or to full satisfaction. Women and girls are still in the most appalling state of oppression and they neglect in too many places. In, and it's in uh, too many mainstream situations. And it's not because they feel like women, but because they are women. And this is a very important dif- difference to make. They are women in biological sense. If you want to see the whole litany of impacts on women, because they are biologically women, up to in far into the 21st century, you could read the book, Invisible Women, by Caroline Criado Perez. You will then see that it's about male bias in tech design, in architecture, in policy, in security, in transportation, in data collection, in healthcare, you name it, it's there. So let's fight this erasure from public speech and administration of the very term women for biologically born women. A woman's rights are sex-based for me, and they are not gender-based. One of the key rights of a woman are that she doesn't have to be very feminine 
or sexually attracted to man to be a woman. She just is one, period. So that's important for me, and that's why I signed this uh, declaration. Thanks, great. Can you tell us about your concerns about UN language and terminology and how it might undermine the rights of women and girls? Well, the original purpose of the gender theory, my, my words, I say theory and not ideology, the original purpose of the gender theory was to explain unequal access of women to the fruits of social, economic and human development. And it was in fact Margaret Mead, an anthropologist, who studied the behavior, the, the grooming of boys and girls for their sexual roles, for their sexually determined, what they then coined the gendered roles, which was laid the basis, as it were, for our understanding of the gender theory as an in support of understanding the woman's subordinate position. But uh, so that was the original purpose of the gender theory. It was to show that the woman having breasts and a vagina didn't make her unfit for duty, for responsibility and for careers outside of the home. And it didn't mean that all the domestic chores had to be for women and girls alone. The purpose was not to pin us down on our biological function, but to recognize it and allow us to be full human beings as biological female. We didn't have to apologize for being female. It, and biologically female doesn't mean that you have less rights of access to human development. And this was after some grumbling, I would say, liberating for many men and boys too, as also my Dewey, Dewey has said, because it's also men who suffer on this kind of worldview, because they also were expected to be manly far beyond the capacity to inseminate a woman. And that's not very convenient for many men as well. So what I feel with this new ideology is that we go back to a stereotyped society in which we may allow more genders, but still the genders define us at all times in all phases and situations of our lives. And that was precisely what we didn't want. We did not want to be gender defined at all times, in all situations, in all stages of our lives. Um, thanks, that's so clear. Um, uh, who's setting the health services agenda and who are the winners and losers in this? And in your opinion, what's behind this increased medicalization and commodification of human bodies? Ah, you're asking very, very heavy, heavy questions here, which really uh, touch at the core of what's happening to our humanity and the way it, that there is a, a, a number of people in power who just want to grab the power. We will say God is dead. We will not have uh, the right to a religious worldview or a worldview other than the worldview that's been promoted. But it means that it's not a human being that is in charge, but just a few human beings who hold the strings and tell the others. So I find this really scary. So I think there is connivance and glee in certain realms where sophisticated science and capital meet for if you disconnect gender completely from the biological uh, from the biological function of a woman and, and man having a child then you have free reign over individuals and generations beyond and behind a fantastic avenue for lifelong dependence on hormones and anti-rejection drugs and complicated surgery that is not without risks and is very expensive and don't with money of the public uh, of the public uh, uh, service, which means that it is at the expense of other pressing needs in medical care, but the procreation, which is borne by couples, it becomes reproduction borne by the fertility industry. So this is how it also disconnects us from our biological roots and from our personal agency, because we will just be like. Uh, animal like animal husbandry and I find this an extremely dangerous uh, development what we see is that the fertility industry is already booming and if you go to one of their fairs as they hold them in Paris you will see that even though they cannot do this in public on let's say in in in, in billboards but if you go there they will tell you yeah 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 we can give you a child the way you want you you tell us and we you select the embryo for you i mean this is just worse than than uh, uh 
a dog uh, a dog fair where you find the most beautiful dog and, 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 and buy that dog. I find it just absolutely, totally unacceptable. And I would say that if the erotic expression of sex becomes more important than its biological function, that is, in a way, it was fine. We needed some separation. But if there is a complete disconnect, then we really are also disconnecting from our biological uh, foundations. And I think that that really cuts loose from nature. We will not be able to protect ourselves or nature from the greed of some of the individuals as represented in firms that are going to kind of take over into yeah. the most intimate of our being. Yeah. Um, I've got my next question is, as a resident of France, uh, what recent developments regarding gender ident identity debate have you noticed in the society? Um, I would say that the, they're different. There is, the, um, there is, of course, the gender debate by the feminists of France, the official feminists. And I noticed there that the concern is strong with the intrusion of transgenders on the space for women. So the feminists defend their space as biologically female, regardless of their sexual orientation. That should not play a, play a role. But I would say in the wider society, but that could be um, a prejudice, not a prejudice, but a sort of conditioning because of uh, my own NGO. And even though I usually switch off the cookies, they will still find you and feed you what is your center of interest. But I would say that on the whole, uh, women in in France and politically also is a strong drive for ever more control over their reproductive function, meaning a longer period of accepting abortion, uh, even arguing that if you couldn't have an abortion because of, for instance, the COVID-19 situation, and you would in desperation kill your, your child, it would not count as a infanticide but it should count as a, um, a, a kind of abortion because of the circumstances so that uh, control over your own body as if it is your own property and your own commodity seems to to be more uh, let's say talked about or written about but the the official concern of the feminist movement is definitely the transgender intrusion, but also the whole issue of language. To a certain extent, there has been support for degenderization, debinarization of the French language. But of course, you cannot do it. I mean, it is it becomes completely impossible to use French if you if you abandon the the dichotomy between a female and male, which has absolutely nothing to do with. Male, male and female in the social sense. So <clears throat> that is a big discussion that divides the society and uh, the pressure of the trans, you know, the, the, you know the, the, the whole movement is to impose this new writing to uh, in schools, but the parents rightfully say it's impossible even to learn that, it's too complicated. And as a linguist myself, I say, you just completely destroy the French thinking. And I would like to draw to the attention of everybody who's concerned about femicide, which is another big issue that the French feminists are very concerned about because there is a lot of femicides in France, but they're not always from uh, by men who use French as their mother tongue, but very often committed by men who express and think in languages that do not have this binary structure. So the whole issue of trying to deconstruct our Western European languages for uh, gender, uh, gender, what is it, bias, is in fact a bit of a futile thing if you imagine that most people think in other languages with other think structures where this binary grammatical thing doesn't exist, but they're still quite capable of male violence, male dominance, patriarchy, etc. To, to oppress women. 
Yeah. Well, that is such a good point. Yeah, that's uh, an interesting about how that's playing out in in France and I guess in other countries where the language is so much more obviously gendered in terms of the structure of it. I mean, everything, pretty much everything in French is either male or female, all the nouns, I guess. Yes. And the word gender just means genus. So it was like in the human, in mankind, in humanity. We distinguished in biology two genus, the, the male and the female, but it doesn't have any other, a, a genus is oak, a, a species of tree. That's also a word for it in, in, in Latin. So the, yeah. the word has been so well. It's very different. Well, um, the last question I want to ask you is, can you tell us about the funding of NGOs in Africa? Well, we we have um, two issues that are coinciding here. We are using more more and more. Uh, there is a discussion of neo-colonial, and in the beginning, I sort of rejected it, having lived in Africa for a long time and have been there at the independence. And I feel, come on, let's go on with things. But <clears throat> some truth, there is some truth in it, because at the moment, African NGOs are mostly concerned with fair access to development. Most African countries are developing. They do have an improving economy. If they don't, it's because of rebels, it's because of, of infighting, it's because of political reasons. But economically speaking, many of these countries have um, an economic growth far over what the Western world has at the present. But, but if they if they want to get access to funds internationally and international approval, they're not allowed to speak about uh, mothers or about um, motherhood or about whatever it is. They have to uh, go into the uh, gender, the gendered language, and they have to give priority over the gendered issues. So they, it's not something that comes from the bottom up, but it's something that's opposed from outside. <clears throat> which is why I think it's a neo-colonial thing to impose upon uh, the African uh, development agencies uh, that they should abide by this new way of thinking, which is absolutely not what they, what they feel like themselves. I feel very sorry because even international or let's say African experts cannot work if they are not a lot, uh, you know, willing to to, well, it's like apostasies that they ask. It's like asking for conversion. I find it very, very uh, disturbing that this has to happen and that they do not have the freedom to think their own way. The agencies that really go for this international terminology about gender equality, etc., they get funded well. So you get more funds to combat, uh, what is it, uh, sexually transmitted diseases in uh, prostitutes uh, communities or sex workers communities but at the same time in the rural areas uh, mothers keep dying in child uh, birth because there is no proper care or because the proper care cannot be reached and because there is no money and it doesn't take much money and much effort to improve it but there is no interest and that is where the uh, African NGOs are as it were uh, tied up so my efforts to get international funding are also stuck there. I'm now planning to create my own little dotation fund so that the team that I've set up that are truly rural African um, developers and changers, big changers in a good sense, who want to work for women, to give rural women their, 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 their space, their, their right to life, their happiness, and I'm going to make sure that they are not going to be swallowed by UNICEF and UNFPA, and I don't know what to dance to the tune of the international global uh, trendsetters, but that they can do it their way, and I will there be in the background to support it, because that's what we want. That's where you can listen to the women. Yeah. So we're just going to go to our last uh, final speaker now, who is um, at Still Tish. And uh, Tish is a, from UK, gender abolitionist and socialist, and she blogged at, blogs as gender critical woman. She's going to talk to us, give a presentation on her findings on funding for NGOs who are promoting gender identity ideology, including Arcus in Africa, Bearings Foundation in the UK, 
um, and she, she'll tell you herself what she's going to do. She is not going to, uh, we're not going to see her face because um, she doesn't feel ready at the moment, or maybe maybe she never will, uh, doesn't want to show her face, I, which I can completely understand because it's very, very tricky doing this work. And I can imagine a lot of people don't want her to be doing it. But thank you so much, Tish, and over to you. Hello. Um, uh, just to explain about the anonymity, I am out in my real name and I hope people in the comments will say that I do use my real name. But I'm a parent of a gay son who's re-identified as transgender. So I have committed to not expose my real name and face, really to protect him from trans activists who may very well single him out to get at me. So it's not any lack of courage on my part. It is just to protect him. Um, just to be clear, I am an adult human female. I fight for women's sex space rights. My son doesn't use female sex spaces. Um, and I unashamedly centre women, biological women, in my feminism. I was inspired by Jennifer Billick um, to look at the foundation's funding gender identity ideology. Um, I certainly was not particularly, I was a bit sceptical when I first started looking at Jennifer's work. I didn't think it would be a big influence in the UK, but it didn't take long to convince me that I was completely wrong. In the UK, it manifests itself in a slightly different way because we have a national health service, but substantively it operates globally. These foundations operate globally and they deploy similar strategies here in the UK and globally. So I've looked at, these are the foundations that I've already looked at. There will be some links later on to blogs that I've done on all except the Open Society Foundation, which I am doing some work on, but I haven't published on that yet. But for the purposes of today, because I'm speaking from the UK, I'm going to look at the Bearings Foundation. These are only four. There are many more. This is a globally funded movement. It's frightening how much money there is in this. So Bearings Bank is a very old established bank in the UK. And those of you may remember that it was brought down by Nick Leeson, who was a rogue trader. Um, but... So the Bearings Bank doesn't exist, but Bearings Foundation still exists. And the reason I looked at this was because there's a cross-party working group in the UK Parliament, APPG, all parliamentary group on LGBTQ. Um, the Bearings Foundation fund this group and they route the money by Kaleidoscope Trust, who are a trans lobby group. Stonewall is involved, they jointly service this group, and Stonewall, as we now know, is basically a trans lobby group. The parliamentary researcher that works for APBG came out of an organisation called, I want to say IGLO, but it's, it's an international organisation for supposedly gay and lesbian rights. It's basically pushing transgender ideology and wants to embed it in the law. Just as a side issue, I have personally had dialogue with a gay male MP and a lesbian MP who are deeply in, in, unhappy with the way the APBG is going on these issues for gay rights in the UK. So that's one chink of light. I'm sure most people in this group, certainly within Europe, may have already heard of the Denton's report. That was a report that was basically a blueprint on how to embed gender identity ideology in law by stealth. It recommends avoiding press coverage. It attached gender identity to popular causes, which is called false teaming. And you could do no better than look at Dr. M, whose Twitter handle is included there, to see her work on there. That's my blog. It contains a link to two versions of the full document because that document was removed from the Denton's website. So many of us grabbed a copy to make sure that it didn't disappear. Bearings Foundation also fund a Stonewall employee and this is where Letitia's earlier presentation has some overlap because they embedded a member of staff in the Department for International Development. They decide where all the overseas aid goes. They're very explicitly wanting to embed LGBT plus agenda in overseas. From where I'm looking, it looks like it's mostly embedding transgender ideology. It seems to be having a negative impact, I would argue, on lesbian, gay, bisexual rights. That's just to give you an idea that the Bearings Foundation code their activity under a heading, under a heading called international development. 
which, you know, sounds fine. In actual fact, everything that they fund is pushing LGBTQ issues. And when I say LGBTQ, it really is transgender, queer theory led. All of this is perfectly legal. Private charitable foundations can allocate monies as they wish. And they are transparent about that. Um, this is a list of all the charities. Uh, and without exception, they either focus completely on transgender issues or they make it clear they are, inverted commas, inclusive of those who determine their attraction based on gender, not sex. Some of them, some of the organisations they fund vociferously promote gender identity ideology. Again, to echo Letitia's point from earlier on, I think some have to pay lip service to it to get the grants. So it's vital that we have some feet on the ground looking at what is actually happening because some of those organisations may actually be doing their level best to keep to their original mission, as we know is happening in UK, where UK organisations are working really hard to preserve single-sex refuges despite having conditions attached to their funding. Um, so I hope you'll get the scale of this when I move on to later work that I've done. I'm only looking at one fairly small foundation, but each of the above organisations that funding drips down to need some detailed scrutiny to work out what's going on. Are they completely captured and a lost hope or could some be rescued if we were able to get some grassroots funding so that they could avoid having to pay lip service or implement policy that they don't agree with? This is just one of those organisations. And again, what I find is a lot of the organisations, they look like they're one thing and they're actually something completely different. So this is called the Social Health and Empowerment Feminist Collection. So you would assume it would be female led and it would be feminist. In actual fact, it's for trans identifying males. Very early on, one of the things that they did was they demanded to be included in a discussion on women's reproductive and sexual health rights, nothing to do with men. They also hosted a trans diva beauty pageant, which if memory serves me, was with the diva magazine in the UK, which some of you will know is run by a lesbian who also funded a museum to um, Jack the Ripper, the serial killer in London, so not a feminist ally. Another thing that the, she also puts on their website is a denial of sexual orientation, basically saying, well, you can see the quote there, contrary to popular belief, a sexual orientation is not solely based on sexual attraction. So again, to echo what Letitia said, this is neo-colonialism. We are embedding gender identity ideology globally. Bearings Foundation, there is a particular focus on former UK colonies. This is exactly what it is. It's a new form of colonialism. And it's interesting that in the UK, we've got many people on the left arguing that sex is a Western colonial imperialist con social construct. They're actually missing the actual colonialism that is happening right under their nose. These are some questions that I try to answer on my blog. ARCA's funding. We get accused of being Christian evangelicals and aligned with them. Actually, a lot of ARCA's funding goes to Christian evangelicals. There is a link between Black Lives Matter and transgender ideology. And somebody following on from my work built on it. She's called Cassandra at Sex Not Gender on Twitter. She did an article following the funding links with Black Lives Matter. Why are the Guardian so woeful on this topic? I've also blogged on that. They are, have a Scott Trust, is oversees them. And a member of the Scott Trust is also on a board of a, a foundation called the Paul Hamlin Foundation. The Paul Hamlin Foundation funds mermaids and transgender lobbying groups. That, I would argue, is one reason why The Guardian in the UK is so poor on this topic. How is the media subject to influence from foundations? I'm told that Open Society Foundation funds The Guardian in the US. There are whole sections, which will come out in my next piece, that are foundations where they specifically target lesbian and gay media to give them money. And then you find that that lesbian and gay media is focusing on transgender ideology, not lesbian and gay rights. What is the link between disability rights activism and rebadging prostitution as sex work? If you look at some of the grants that are coming out from the Open Society Foundation, they explicitly link the right to sex for disabled men to 
rebadging prostitution as sex work. And I'll be doing a download of that and passing it on to Dr. M, who's very concerned about this. How did reproductive justice fights get used? Sorry about my spelling mistake there, to push gender identity ideology. Again, it's forced teaming. You latch onto an issue that has popular support, drive funds, build up alliance, pretend there's a common cause, and then you hijack those movements to promote gender identity ideology. How much money is going to universities? Lots of money is going to universities. They may not be specifically about LGBTQ or trans issues, but it makes them beholden to these foundations. Um, and then another area of concern for me, obviously, having a son caught up in this, is how much money is to be made from global industry creating lifelong medical patients? They're just links to all of my different pieces on this. One of the ones I would want to draw your attention to is the one on lesbian and gay rights in African countries, because by pushing this ideology in countries where you've either got no gay rights in law or you've got very few, it's recent, it's not deeply embedded, it's not socially acceptable, there is a particular risk that by pushing transgender ideology, we're going to encourage people to embrace a faux straight gay man in a medicalised closet, or similarly with lesbians, it's deeply harmful that we're pushing this ideology in, in African countries. So just to, just to finish, um, I did get a lot of work from Alan Hennis. He, he's at, at Zeno001, who I'd been doing a lot of the work manual and it took me days, but he has taught me how to extract data from online databases and done it for me. So he'll be helping me do some more work on this. My blog covers research on transgender medicine, who is being transitioned, gay males, lesbians, autos autistic kids, and also a lot of kids in care. I've also blogged on that. I look at judicial cases, so cases where men are put in female prisons. I've been looking at cases that go back as far as 2009 in the UK. I also look at the organisations that are promoting gender ideology in schools. So I think I've probably done about 10 pieces on transgender packs for schools. I've also looked at Childline, which is run by the NSPCC, which is supposed to be a charity that protects children. I've done 10 blogs on that. They promote some horrendous porn and they also promote queer theory to children or under 18s. And then, as you can see, I've latterly started to do work on charitable foundations funding the Institute of, Institution of Transgender Ideology. I've got heaps of data. I've already had people that contacted me on Twitter. I can do a bespoke search if you want me to look at a particular foundation or an organisation that's near you, or you want me to, to do a country-based search so you can see what's happening in your area or any particular issue I can do. Oh, yes. And also woman work wished, <laughs> which I can't pronounce. And then just the second thing, obviously, I've got a gay son. I consider to him be a refugee from masculinity. I am not saying that this agenda is not a very male led. It absolutely is. But there's a reason why they're getting gay boys. And we're, make, we're basically making a new class of eunuchs to police women. And they are victims in this. It doesn't mean to say I give them free pass because identifying as a woman is a misogynist thing to do. And I do not give a free pass to my son for that. But this is what's happening to our gay boys. And it's also 4,000% increase in referrals to gender identity services was women. They are definitely the main ones. But it, there was also 1,152% increase in boys. And if you look at the stats from the Tavistock, if you add in same-sex attracted and the ones that identify as bisexual, we are going for people who are not heterosexual.